Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Just be mindful of everybody's morning. I know it's kind of early. Um, good morning. I'm Victoria Lancy, Rural Education Manager for Michigan Center for Rural Health, and we'd like to welcome everybody to our Macro MIPS and APM's education series. Our topic this month is understanding the improvement activities category. Just a few reminders if you're logged into the webinar portion using the link provided, you can use you can listen to the audio through the computer speakers if you are participating via the phone number provided. Don't worry, we are recording each webinar and the webinar will be posted on the MCRH website, which is www.mcrh.msu.edu. Click on the resources tab across the top and then from the drop down, select the quality payment, pay for performance drop down. Um, if you would like to ask a question during the during the program, please type it into the chat feature, and then um, I will relay the question during the Q and A component at the end, or you can ask it during the Q and A component at the end of the program when the lines are unmuted. With that, I would like to introduce our speakers today from Hall Wender, Killian, and Heath and Lyman, um, Brian Bauer, and Lisa Lusudo. Go ahead and take it over. Thank you so much, Victoria. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us bright and early. Um, today, Brian and I are going to discuss the MIPS Improvement Activities Performance category. The goal of our presentation today is to give you a high-level understanding of the MIPS Improvement Activities Performance category, and we'll walk through some of the requirements of the performance category, including some of the available activities, submission mechanisms to submit your data, reporting requirements associated with this performance category, scoring, and some practical examples of how this performance category is scored. We'll talk about some key policy takeaways, and we'll wrap up the presentation today by talking about tips to maximize your points in this performance category. So just as a quick reminder for everyone, and maybe some of you who are just joining us for this part five of our webinar series, I wanted to go through the general overview of the MIPS performance categories for performance year 2018. So as you can see, the MIPS program is comprised of four different performance categories for reporting year 2018. And the improvement activities performance category is worth 15 points out of the 100 total possible final points you can earn under the MIPS program. Each of these four categories are added together to get your final MIPS score. And your final MIPS score will be compared to the MIPS performance threshold to determine whether you or your practice will receive a positive, negative, or neutral payment adjustment for your Medicare Part B payments. It's important to note that if you achieve 15 points as a bare minimum, you will ach achieve a neutral payment adjustment, meaning you won't get dinged. Um, so as you can see, the improvement activities category is worth 15. So if you do really well in this performance category, at a bare minimum, you at least will not be dinged with a negative payment adjustment. So CMS created the Improvement Activities category to assess your participation in activities that will improve your clinical practice, including a focus on ongoing care coordination, clinical and patient shared decision making, regularly using patient safety practices, and expanding practice access. Again, this performance category is worth 15% or 15 points of your MIPS final score for performance year 2018. And under this category, there's a minimum performance period of 90 consecutive days. And we'll talk about that in some greater detail in the next few slides. So for the 2018 performance period, you will be able to choose from 112 different improvement activities that are divided under nine subcategories. And CMS is giving you and your practice flexibility to select improvement activities that make the most sense for you and your practice. And you're not required to submit improvement activities in all different nine um, subcategories you have ultimately flexibility over which improvement activities make the most sense for you. So 
So there are five different ways for you and your practice to submit data for the improvement activities performance category, and depending on how you're, you're classified may depend on, on which way you submit your data for this performance category. So the first is the attestation method. This method is available for groups and individuals. It's a simple check the box method to show that you perform the particular activity. CMS has recommended that if you choose to submit data under this method, you should keep documentation for six years per CMS's guidelines. Alternatively, you can submit data through a qualified clinical data registry. And if you are submitting to a QCDR, groups must submit the data to both a QCDR and also a test. You can submit data through a qualified registry, an EHR, but if you are doing it through electronic health record, you have to be submitting your data through 2015 certified EHR technology. And then finally, if you're a group of 25 or more, you're able to submit your data through the CMS web interface model, and this option is also available to virtual groups as well. So there are some unique um, aspects of this performance category if you're a MIPS APM. So if you are participating in a MIPS APM and you're included on that particular APM's participant list under one of the three following assessment dates, so the key dates are March 31st, June 30th, or August 31st, you will not need to report any improvement activities. In fact, you'll receive full credit for this performance category in 2018. And for MIPS APMs, improvement activities are actually weighted at 20%. Improvement activity performance category scores for MIPS APMs are based on the improvement activities that are required by the ATM, APM. Excuse me. There are no additional reporting requirements that are necessary. And for 2018, all MIPS APMs will automatically receive the maximum points at the APM entity level for this particular performance category. So less work is required for you if you're participating as a MIPS APM. There are also opportunities in this performance category for bonus points. Um, this performance category has some overlap with the promoting interoperability performance category, which was formerly known or more commonly known possibly by you as the advancing care information performance category. So if you are submitting improvement activities that are marked as certified EHR technology eligible and you're using certified EHR technology to submit, you're eligible for a 10% bonus in the performing, promoting interoperability performance category. And Brian will later um, walk through an example of how that is scored. So what are the reporting requirements for the improvement activities performance category? Under this performance category, you must report up to four measures to equal a score of 40 possible points to earn full credit in this category. So the maximum amount of points you can earn in this category is 40. You must submit each measure with data documenting that the activity was done for a minimum of 90 consecutive days. So that is the minimum threshold that you must perform um, a particular measure. It's important that you keep in mind the measures you report do not have to be for the same 90-day period. So uh, out of the four measures, you can select multiple different 90-day periods that possibly make the most sense for you and your practice. So we recommend that you sort out which 90-day timeframe will give you the best performance results for each measure that you submit. This slide details some key reporting deadlines. So for all eligible conditions that are participating in the MIPS program, March 31st, 2019 is the deadline for submitting data for the 2018 performance year. The performance period for 2018 started on January 1, 2018 and runs through December 31st, 2018. For this particular reporting category, keep in mind that you don't have to report for the entire performance year. You just have to report um, each measure for a 90 consecutive day period. So for example, to avoid a negative payment adjustment, you can submit improvement activities data for as few as 90 consecutive days. So let's jump into how this category is scored. C 
CMS will score individual improvement activities as either high weighted or medium weighted. So there are two different categories depending on the measures you select. High weighted activities for most practitioners are worth 20 points and medium weighted activities are worth 10. So providers are required to perform either four medium weighted activities or two high weighted activities or any combination of high weighted and medium weighted activities for 2018 to achieve that final total score of 40 points for this performance category. This slide details some examples that CMS has put out of high weighted activities and medium weighted activities. So as you can see, there are a, a wide variety um, of, of options for you to select from. And this slide just highlights some of those examples. So again, there are a total of 40 possible points that you can earn in this performance category. For most practitioners, activity weights will be weighted for medium weighted activities at 10 points or high weighted at 20. However, if you do qualify as a special status group, the weighting is doubled. So medium weighted activities will actually be worth 20 points, whereas high weighted activities will be worth 40. These special status groups include clinicians in small group practices, which are 15 or fewer eligible clinicians, rural practices, and clinicians in under, underserved practices, or if you are a non-patient facing clinician or group, you will also qualify for the special status. And I also want to note, full credit is given to clinicians in a patient-centered medical home, medical home model, or similar specialty practice. So as I mentioned, for most groups to earn full credit, so that is if you are not in a designated special um, group, so that means you're an individual group or virtual group with 15 or more clinicians that aren't in a rural area or a HIPSA, you should submit one of the following combinations in order to receive the full credit 40 points in this category. So that would be two high-weighted activities in any subcategory. So each high-weighted activity is worth 20. That will give you 40 points you can elect to submit one high-weighted activity and two medium-weighted activities in any subcategory, or you can have the option of submitting four different medium-weighted activities valued at 10 points each to get you to 40. As I briefly mentioned on a few earlier slides, if you're a participant in a certified patient-centered medical home, comparable specialty practice or an APM designated as a medical home model, you will automatically receive full credit in this particular performance category. Additionally, if you are a MSSP program track one or oncology care model participant, you will automatically receive points based on the requirements of participating in that advanced payment model. So many of you may be a part of small practices, so it's important to remind you that if you are, these high-weighted activities are worth 40 points, so you'll only need to report one and be successful in reporting one in order to get um, full points in this particular performance category. And again, medium-weighted activities are worth 20, so the burden on you selecting and attesting to improvement activities is reduced. Small group practices can achieve half of the total category score by completing one medium weighted improvement activity. So that's very important to remind all of you who are a part of small practices. As I previously mentioned, certified patient medical home participants have unique reporting obligations. In fact, if you're a MIPS eligible clinician participating in a certified patient centered medical home, you actually receive full credit for the improvement activities performance category. However, starting in 2018, 50% of practice sites within a multi-practice tax ID number or a tax ID that is part of a virtual group will need to be certified or recognized as a patient-centered medical home in order to receive the full credit. So very important for you to, if you are participating in a certified patient-centered medical home to ensure that you are in fact certified or recognized by CMS in order for you to achieve the full credit in this particular performance category. Again, I just wanted to highlight some of the special considerations for special status participants. So as a reminder, if you are 
qualified as a special status participant, meaning you're a clinician in a small practice of 15 or fewer, you're non-patient facing, you are practicing in a rural area or a HIPSA, then you will receive double points for each high or medium weighted activity as an individual clinician group or virtual group. And again, participants in the certified patient medical home model or comparable specialty practice will earn the maximum improvement activity score by attesting during this period. And again, re-emphasizing that you must be certified. And with that, I'm going to throw it over to Brian to walk you through the scoring standards. Thanks, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, so Lisa did a great job of explaining how the scoring is done. So we thought we'd just take, take a look at some examples. So the improvement activity performance score is, is the total number of points that you achieve by completed the activities divided by the, the possible maximum points, then times, times 100. So with this scenario, um, you're a, cl a clinician in a large practice and complete only one medium weight uh, improvement activity for 10 of the 40 points in this category. So 10 of 40 is 25% of the available points for the improvement activity. Then you multiply that by the weight given for the improvement activity as the, that percentage of, it, of what it is of your total performance score. And you see that what you'll achieve for an improvement activity final score is 3.75%. So one tip that we want to make sure we point out is credit in this category is capped at 40 points. So I think, as Lisa pointed out earlier, in order to avoid a negative adjustment for this 2018 reporting period, um, the score that you need to beat or the performance threshold that your score needs to exceed is 15 points. So um, if you were to maximize the 40 points for this improvement activity, you would actually, your performance score would at least be 15 points, so you would avoid a negative adjustment. Thing here is, I, I, we don't want to, we want to make sure that you understand that you don't get a bunch of extra bonus points if you do more than the required. Um, so if you are, if you're a, a larger practice, well, let's go spa, a smaller or special status practice. Um, you know, medium weighted activities receive 20 points, high weighted 40 points. So, you know, it's, it's important to understand not to tax or overstress or I, you already have enough things that you're doing in a given day or week. So you only need to focus on one particular performance activity if that's a high weighted activity and you'll reach the maximum 40 points. So that would give you 15 points on your performance score, which should, uh, will, which will uh, avoid a negative adjustment for this reporting period. So in scenario two, um, you're a clinician in a large practice and complete one high-weighted uh, improvement activity for 20 of the 40 points. Uh, so 20 of the 40 is 50%, and if you run it through the equation, you see that that times the weight gets you uh, a final score um, of 7.5%. Scenario three, a clinician, again, in a large practice, but in this case, completes four of the median weight improvement activities for 40 of the 40. Uh, again, going through the equation, you see there, um, you reach the full 15%, which would be 15 points on your performance score, um, which again, would meet that uh, performance threshold to avoid a negative adjustment. In scenario four, again, we, we have, a, in, well, in this case, we have a small practice um, that has completed two medium weight improvement activities for a score of 40 uh, points. So 40 of 40 is 100%. Again, running it through the equation, you see that you reach your performance score um, 15%, 100% for this category, 15% for your performance score. So again, you should avoid a negative adjustment. So Lisa mentioned this before, and I think it's it's important to understand this because I think it's uh, in some ways a, a work-saving opportunity for you. Um, 
the improvement activities actually overlap with, um, in some cases, uh, the quality um, act, uh, the quality category, and also the promoting interoperability category. I personally think advancing care information was easier to say, but um, CMS changed it to performing or promoting interoperability. But the key here is that although you have to report it separately, by doing the same activity, you're able to achieve a score in more than one category. So in, in the case um, with regards to the quality category, um, you if the, the two top or the topic areas that overlap are the depression screening, tobacco user, alcohol screening, and fall risk screening. So you'll need to report if you if you engage in these activities, improvement activities, they will also count towards your quality score. The promoting interoperability category aligns with the improvement activities as well. Again, clinicians uh, must report the activities in both categories separately uh, to receive points in both categories. But again, um, you're only doing the work once, you're just reporting it twice. So looking at um, the bonus scoring for EHR use. If you use certified EHR technology to complete the improvement activities, you can earn uh, a 10% bonus of your score for the promoting interoperability performance category. So if you had otherwise had a performance or a, yeah, a performance score of 80% in the promoting interoperability category and you use EHR technology to complete the improvement activities that you're reporting on, your score in the promoting interoperability category goes up by 10%. And so you see the equation here, your original score for promoting interoperability was 80%. You receive the bonus, gives you a totus, a total of um, 90% for the promoting interoperability score. And the promoting interoperability score, as we talked about last month, is weighted at 25%. So you, that extra bonus of doing it through EHR helps you both in both ways. and You actually get more weight here in the promoting interoperability category. So in this case, the final score for promoting interoperability would be 22.5%. So some key policy takeaways for 2018. Um, MIPS eligible clinicians in small practices and practices in rural areas uh, will continue to report on, have to report no more than two activities to receive the highest score. And again, as Lisa explained, if you use a high weighted activity, you only have to report on one activity. 50% of practice sites with a TIN or TINs that are a part of a group or virtual group um, need to be recognized as patient-centered medical homes uh, for the 10 to receive full credit. So, in other words, if, if you are um, reporting as a single 10 uh, tax ID number, if you're reporting that way, at least 50% of your sites need to be certified. Or, and we'll talk more about this next month, if you're reporting as a, uh, as a part of the group or a virtual group, um, you have to have 50% of the TINs that are rep, um, reporting as that group for, um, to be certified in order to receive full credit. Uh, again, with group reporting, only one MIPS eligible clinician in the TIN must perform the improvement activity to receive credit. Um, again, I, I, think, I think overall, um, rolling it out for the entire um, group is probably a better approach, but the actual requirement is that only one clinician needs to be um, performing and reporting on the improvement activity to receive credit. And this applies to virtual groups as well. Only one MIPS eligible clinician must uh, perform the improvement activity for the 10 to receive the full credit. CMS is continuing to delegate, uh, I'm sorry, designate activities within the improvement activities performance category that are also qualify for promoting interoperability. Um, so it's the bonus that we talked about a minute ago. 
Uh, I think that's a, a real plus. And uh, the allow, allowing for simple attestation um, of the improvement activities is a real plus too. So when you think about the, the check the box sort of category, um, it really reduces the amount of work um, connected with the reporting for the performance improvement activity. The thing you remember though is that you do have to maintain documentation and the documentation needs to be maintained for six years. Um, CMS has always retains the right to audit and so if, if they were to do so, you're going to need to have that documentation to support your attestation that you perform that activity for the required 90 days. So tips to maximize points. <clears throat> Select activities you expect you and your practice can do well. Um, I, I think it, it may seem kind of self-explanatory um, that yeah, you wanna focus on this, but there's 112 different um, program or performance improvement activities that you can select from. And although it takes a little bit of time to sit down as far as um, well, if you're a solo practice, it's maybe less time than if you're a group, but it's well worth the effort to sit down and work through the process and think about what's going to be easiest for your practice, your practitioners, your staff um, to maintain and successfully perform and to do it for 90 consecutive days. Um, again, implementing it with the mindset that you're going to do it full time going forward in your practice is the easiest way to maintain that 90 consecutive days. But you know, you just don't want to lose track and you know get halfway through and on the 50th day skip and then oh now we got to start the 90th. Um, you know, you all have very busy practices and you need to make sure that you select uh, an activity that's going to be easy to do for your practice, but also I think to promote the well-being of your patients and the success of your practice. So it's worth taking a little bit of time to, to really look at those and figure out and do some strategy. Uh, aim for 40 points uh, that will give you the full credit for the 15% of your MIPS composite score. As we talked about, that's the threshold for 2018 to receive uh, no negative adjustment in your 2020 reimbursement adjustment. And obviously, um, if you if you were able to accomplish that 15% in just this activity um, category, then any additional points you score in the other activities like the quality or the promoting interoperability category will just improve um, your chances to receive, well, will um, result in you receiving a positive adjustment, just not just avoiding a negative adjustment. Have to report for 90 consecutive days. Um, and again, you're gonna need um, to keep evidence of that um, for the 90 consecutive days. So you'll need to come up with a, a mechanism for tracking and documenting that it was actually um, accomplished or carried out for those 90 days. Uh, the measures do not need to be from the same 90-day consecutive time frame. Um, so if you're doing it for 60 days, uh, I'm sorry, for six months, if you're doing it for 180 days, um, you know, you have some flexibility to go, well, as long as it's consecutive, we can focus in on the consecutive 90 days that give us the best performance. So, um, you know, just running it for longer than 90 days and not just focusing on the 90 days is the better way to go. Um, if you qualify as a small practice or a rural provider, if you're in a HIPSA, um, your points double, that's always a plus. Um, selecting just one high-weighted activity will allow you to achieve 40 points if you're in one of those special status categories. So just to highlight or uh, recap some of the upcoming topics, uh, next month we're gonna be covering the understanding the requirements for the cat cost category. Although you don't actually report on the cost category, um, it's important to understand it because things that you are doing in your practice will impact how you perform in the cost category. So even though you're not going to attest or submit data on that category, if you understand how it's calculated and how it impacts your practice, you will be able by implementing changes or practices in your practice 
to um, impact the actual score that you receive in the cost category. Um, we'll also touch on virtual groups. Um, that's a, a plus that's available out there for our smaller practices in particular. October, we're going to be looking at uh, doing a little bit more with virtual groups um, and uh, MIPS APMs. We, the, the virtual groups, um, to qualify that, there has to be agreements between the various independent groups that are or independent practitioners that are participating in the virtual group. So we want to make sure we cover those um, group uh, virtual group agreements. Then we'll be talking about the re um, in the upcoming months, talking about uh, the actual reporting and some insights and tips on how to successfully do that for um, all of the various categories. So we'll do that November, December, and January. And then February, we're going to be covering any last minute reporting issues because, of course, the deadline for reporting for the 2018 calendar year is actually the end of March 2019. So we want to make sure that we cover any last minute issues there just to assist you in getting it all in in a timely manner. And then uh, in March, we'll take a look and start um, looking at the, the new developments for the 2019 reporting year so that we can get started off on that year uh, successfully. So with that, Victoria, I'll turn it back to you for any questions or comments. Thanks, Brian. So if we have any questions, please type them into the chat box. All the lines are unmuted, so we can go ahead and ask questions. Um, are there any questions or comments for Brian or Lisa? And, and Victoria, while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, I do want to um, just repeat, I think we've said it every month, but just want to make sure everybody feels comfortable with it. Our contact information is there in the slides. Yep. And, you know, we certainly welcome anyone if they have any questions and they want to raise the question offline for any reason. Uh, Lisa and I are very happy to talk with them. Yes. And then I will also state that our next um, webinar will be on in September, on September 27th, at the end of the month, again at the same time. Um, and it will be on cost category and virtual groups, um, just to give you a little plug. Okay. Doesn't look like we have any questions. But again, thank you, Lisa and Brian, for joining us so early in the morning. Um, and it was a great program. Thank you so much. Thanks, Victoria, thank and thanks, everyone. Thank you.